Good morning. Thank you for coming today, taking time out on your Saturday to listen to some of these ideas. And thank you for Roberto and Maria who've brought us out here to South America to be lecturing. Uh, we've been in Argentina, Paraguay, Chile, and now Brazil. So it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so what I'm going to do is try to give a basic overview and an orientation to what we're going to be talking about, uh, sorry, what we're going to be talking about in the next couple of days. Um, as I think Tal said, we're taking a philosophical look at the nature of and battle for freedom or for liberty. And Ayn Rand insisted that the battle and the fight for freedom is a philosophical fight. And I'm going to really emphasize that. And when you see the topics that we're going to be talking about um, in the next couple of days, they're heavily philosophical. And I want to explain a little bit um, about the way that Ayn Rand looks at the world, the way that she looks at the rise of liberty and freedom and its demise or when we step backwards and we lose our freedom and our liberties and why that is. <clears throat> and one way to capture the way that she looks at the world, the way that she looks at history is with this contrast of ideas and it's really a set of ideas or two world views, an individualist world view and a collectivist world view. And she thinks these two sets of ideas have been at play in Western history. <clears throat> and one side gives rise to science, progress, technology, freedom, prosperity. And one side gives rise or destroys all of those things. She's squarely on the side of individualism and squarely against collectivism. But one of the things that's interesting, and I'm going to touch on this um, in my presentation, is she thinks most people and most thinkers are on the side of collectivism, including the defenders of liberty. They're in many ways on the side of the collectivist ideas. <clears throat> and if you're trying to understand why the, the battle for liberty is so difficult, one of the reasons she thinks, one of the explanations is the people who say they're on the side of liberty. And some of them, I think, are actively and conscientiously trying to fight for freedom, for liberty, make all kinds of concessions to the other side and agree with the other side in philosophical terms. And when that happens, what is going to win out is collectivism, not individualism. <clears throat> so let me take a, a kind of broad, very broad overview of the way that she looks at history. So you've probably seen this, uh, is this working? Oh, there, there we go. Um, you've probably seen this graph. Uh, this is in, in a lot of economics classes, economic discussions, this graph is put up. So this is um, looking at world GDP per capita over the last thousand years, uh, about <clears throat> um, from pretty much uh, AD 1000 to present or to the 2000s. And it, it's called the hockey stick graph for, uh, for I think, a, if you know what a hockey stick looks like, this is, it, it's, it's supposed to be flat, and then you have this acceleration of progress from about 1750 or 1800, and this rising GDP. Now this is a real fact, though, oversimplified in this graph, I think, and I'm gonna talk about this in a moment. <clears throat> but that we've had some incredible progress and incredible developments in the last 200 years is a true fact, I think. And one of the interesting intellectual issues is what is responsible for this rise? And often you'll get the answer, which I think is part of the answer, but not the full answer. It's freedom or free markets, um, or liberty, or capitalism. That's what's responsible for this. And in a sense, that's true, but if that's all you think that is responsible for this um, graph, I think that's a mistake. And I think, uh, here's a, what a more accurate graph looks like. And this is zooming out, not starting in 1000 AD, but starting earlier in Western history. And I'm focusing particularly on Europe. And it's not true 
that things had been flat and then you have this incredible progression in the 1800s and then it's been flat for as you go back in history that it's flat and flat and flat you had a major rise <clears throat> in knowledge and in progress and in standard of living in the ancient world in ancient Greece and then ancient Rome and if you've ever visited Greece or Rome and seen what the Greeks and Romans were able to do if you have visited Athens <clears throat> the idea that they were just living in like squalor and poverty is not true. Um, when I took a class as an undergraduate in, 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 on ancient history in ancient Greece, ancient Rome, the professor made the point, which I think is a true point, that in 100 AD, the standard of living in the Roman Empire <clears throat> was higher than it ever attained in Europe until the 19th century. So for 17 or 18th century, we had gone down and then stagnated for a long period of time. But you had a major rise in the ancient world in terms of standard of living. And so it's not that you have stagnation and then progress. You can have progress and you can go backwards. Um, and I think that's part of what South America has seen in the last 100, 150 years is actually going backwards. <clears throat> and then, so you get, there's really two great periods that you get enormous uh, rises in productivity, in knowledge, in standard of living, and you have periods of going backwards. And even part of the oversimplification of that other graph, I think, if you think of the last 200 years, it's not a straight line upward. I mean, take South America. It's not a straight line upward in the last 200 years. I put some of the things that have happened in Europe in its colony, I mean, it's, its most significant colony, the United States of America. I mean, you had World War I, you had World War II, you have the whole communist bloc that sweeps part of Eastern Europe and so on. And the idea that their standard of living was just this enormous rise, continuing rise, is not true. It went backwards. Um, and in World War I and World War II, it goes backwards again. <clears throat> so this is part of how Ayn Rand looks at the, if, if we're taking this kind of broad overview of history, it, the hockey stick graph is not exactly right. And it's important that it's not exactly right. You have periods of real progress, you have periods of going backwards, and, and even in the last 200 years, it's a battle between um, the forces of progress and the forces of decline. <clears throat> and she thinks the basic explanation of why you get periods where you have dramatic rises in standard of living and why you get periods where you have dramatic falls in standard of living is the issue of individualism versus collectivism. That when individualist ideas are at the heart of a culture <clears throat> and are accepted by the people in the countries or nations or empires, you get progress, you get development, and when the ideas of collectivism are what are ascending and are what people accept, then you get either stagnation or actually going backwards retrogression. And so now what I want to focus on for the rest of the time is what these ideas are. I'm going to skip this. Is clicker, is, is it, do I need to be closer? Can you, can you advance the slide one more? One more slide? Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> um, this, in a nutshell, I think, is how to think both of individualism and collectivism as uh, worldviews, as a set of ideas that go together. So individualism we, and collectivism, we tend to think, I think, in political terms of this distinction and this conflict. And it's right, it, it is partly a political issue, but the political issue has deep roots in more fundamental ideas, in philosophical ideas. <clears throat> so politically, the way I think to think about individualism and collectivism, individualism assist, is a system. It's, a it's a, an approach to politics that places the individual first as the primary focus, as the unit of value of what's significant. <clears throat> um, and the full expression of individualism politically, I think, comes at the end of the Enlightenment. And this is its whole view of government that gets cemented by the American Revolution and the new form of government. And it's radically new. 
that you get in America with the founding of America in the late 1800s. And it's this view that the individual is what counts. He has rights. So you get the concept of man's rights or of individual rights. He has rights that come before any government, any nation, any state. And the goal and the purpose and why a government, if it's a good government, if it's a proper government, why it's needed and what makes it good or what makes it proper is the government is the servant of the individual. And it's important, the government is the servant of the individual. The individual has primacy, the government is the servant. It exists to secure, to protect, and to enforce each individual's rights. So it, it, this is the first time in history that it's not the state as the voice of the people or the voice of the aristocracy or the voice of the proletariat or the voice of the German people or the Japanese people. The state as the voice of the collective. That's what holds power. That's what's significant. That is what's primary. That's the unit of value. That's where the focus should be. And the individual is subordinate, the individual is a servant to the state's goals. That's what collectivism is politically. <clears throat> it subordinates the individual to the group and its political representatives. And the group can be cashed out in various kinds of ways uh, in, e in terms of economic classes, in Marxism, in communism, in more racial lines, in various forms of fascism or nationalistic lines. But it's the group is given power and is given primacy, and the individual is subordinate. And one way you can think about this, and the way that Ayn Rand thinks about it, it's capitalism, but capitalism as the system of individual rights. It's a political economic system. It's not just an economic system. It's a, there's certain political principles that govern the whole system. And the basic idea is the idea of individual rights that's capitalism. And then you have various forms of statism, which are expressions of collectivism politically. The state holds power, the individual is insignificant, subordinate, a servant, a slave, and even dispensable if they declare some particular individual an enemy of the state. Then they can be killed for the sake of the collective. So this is the conflict between individualism and collectivism politically. But why, on the side of individualism, does the capitalist system, or a system of individual rights, why, does that be, why is that seen in a certain period of history as this is the ideal, this is what we should be striving for? Why were the American revolutionaries trying to create a system in which the government has one goal, which is to secure the rights of the individual? And by contrast, why is it that collectivism, as a political ideal is seen as an ideal, is seen as something good, is seen as something to strive for. <clears throat> and I think to answer that, and certainly Ayn Rand's answer to this question, is you have to look at the philosophical ideas that generate these views and generate the idea either that capitalism is the system uh, we should be striving for and working to achieve, or some form of statism, of collectivism politically, is the system we should be trying to achieve. <clears throat> and one of the deepest roots of this in terms of people's moral views of what they think is right and wrong, what they should pursue, what they should avoid, what they value and what they think is a disvalue, what they think is a virtue and what they think is vice. So their moral views, one of the central issues is when you look at the the generation of capitalism, and I, I'm taking the American system and its form of government as the ultimate expression, the closest the world has ever got to a fully capitalist or fully individualist system. You had this idea of the rights of man or the rights of the individual. These rights are egoistic. They're about self-interest. They're about the pursuit of one's rational self-interest. They're about, as Ayn Rand will put it provocatively, they're about the virtue of selfishness. <clears throat> a right to life, if you take the rights that, when they talked about the rights of man or the rights of the individual, what were the rights? The rights to life, to liberty, to property, to the pursuit of happiness. These were all rights you hold as an individual to pursue. A right to life is the right to take the actions 
the actions as a rational person that you have to be able to take in order to live your life. They're all focused on you. It's a right to my life. And so it's a right that I have freedom of thought. <clears throat> I'm able to entertain the ideas that I want to entertain, discuss them with other people, so I have freedom of speech, I have freedom of association, I can talk to who I want, and avoid the people I don't want to talk to. This is free, all freedoms I enjoy so that I can reach knowledge, I can figure out what's true, and I can advocate for what I think is true. And no collective, including no, so no group, no gang, no state, can say, no, you're not allowed to think that, or you're not allowed to speak that, or you're not allowed to associate with these people, you have to associate with those people. All the things that happen, for instance, under communism or fascism. <clears throat> a right to life is a right to my life. It's about my life, my self-interest. <clears throat> a right to liberty is my thinking, my ability to express myself. A right to property is the right to go out create things, produce things, and then keep them for myself. It's again directed at self. And most provocatively, and I think this is, I mean, this is a deliberate formulation in terms uh, in the, of the Enlightenment thinkers. It's a right to the pursuit of my happiness. That should be the goal morally. That, if I'm a moral person, what I should be working towards is my happiness. Not the good of the group, not the good of the race, not the good of the nation, not the good of God, my own happiness. <clears throat> so this, the free market system, capitalism as a system of individual rights came from a certain moral view. <clears throat> and underneath this moral view, so if I have the right to pursue my life, a right to freedom of thought, freedom of speech, a right to think and then produce and keep these things, that that if I have this kind of right, that presupposes a view that I'm a rational being, that I have a mind capable of thinking, and that I can think for myself, that I can figure out these things, I can reach knowledge, I can learn to create all kinds of different forms of property from a, mic from a microphone to all the wonders we have uh, in the room today, wireless technology, access to the internet, and so on. All this comes from a person's thinking and from an individual's ability to think and then to create. And the view of man as a rational being and that one should have confidence in the power of reason is what underlies the moral view and the moral view underlies the political view. <clears throat> and even deeper than the, this view of reason or related to this view of reason is that I have the power to choose my fate in life. I can make of myself what I will. I as an individual, it doesn't matter what group I belong to, where, what traditions my ancestors practiced, what my race is, what nation I happen to be born in. I have a power of choice and a fundamental control over my own life. And this is the enlightenment view that you get and it's what leads to the view of that rights are important and we need capitalism as a system of a political economic system or a view of uh, the proper view of government. So that you have this view that we have the power of choice or free will, that we're rational beings who can guide our lives by our own minds, that what we should be doing is pursuing our own happiness. And therefore, we demand politically the rights to life, liberty, property, and the pursuit of happiness. <clears throat> Collectivism opposes all these deeper roots. It says all these deeper roots are wrong. <clears throat> Morally, it says, no, you should not be pursuing your own happiness. That is not what a good person does. That is not what a moral person does. A moral person subordinates himself. He views himself as unimportant, insignificant. What's important is other people. Other people as a group. And you can cash out, it's the poor, it's the needy, we've got to serve the proletariat, <clears throat> we've got to serve the nation, which means all the other people who happen to have been born in this geographical location. We have to serve the race. <clears throat> Whatever it is that is cashed out, who the others are that you have to live for, the crucial message is do not live for yourself. 
And this is the moral view in one way or another that almost everybody accepts, including almost every defender of liberty, accepts this view that morally you should be living for others. Now why would you have a system, a political system in which you have the right to live for yourself if morally what you should be doing is living for others? This is a deep contradiction. This is a contradiction that Ayn Rand thinks no um, free system can survive. Sooner or later, this contradiction is going to come back to haunt um, the advocates and the defenders and the creators of liberty. That she thinks this is the basic reason, um, morally, why liberty comes to an ascendancy in the 18th and 19th century in America, and various liberties are then lost going into the 20th century. Because this, this, this moral conflict has never been resolved. And, and we're going to talk more about that through this week. Oh, I mean, it's the weekend. So it, collectivism morally says the pursuit of happiness, the pursuit of your own life, that is wrong. <clears throat> In terms of should you view your own self as a rational being capable of thinking of figuring out what to do in life, what to value, what to pursue. What collectivism says is, no, an individual is not a rational being. <clears throat> to say he's a fragment of the collective is to say he can't guide his own life. And if you can't guide your own life, if you can't think for yourself, what are you going to turn to? How are you going to decide what to do? How are you going to know what to do? You can't look at your own mind and its functioning. You have to look to other people. Other people are going to tell you what to do. <clears throat> so if you think people are not rational, the alternative ultimately is some form of authoritarianism. It's some form of, of people should be obeying the authorities. And again, whether the authorities are cashed out as the German leadership, so Hitler and his party, or the voice of the proletariat, and so the dictators in the, and, the, and the Communist Party in various communist nations, <clears throat> or the white landowners, if you take American slavery uh, in the 19th century, which for sure is a form of collectivism, <clears throat> we're able to understand the world and so on somehow. The blacks are incapable of reasoning, of thinking for themselves. So their proper position is that of a servant, of a slave, because they can't guide their own lives. We're doing them a favor which is some of the arguments for slavery. We're doing them a favor by enslaving them because they can't think for themselves. So this is a deep, <clears throat> this is a deep, deep idea within collectivism of authoritarianism comes from a denial of reason. <clears throat> and then collectivism related to that says, you're not really able to control your own life. You're not in charge. You're determined by outside forces. And all the major collectivists are determinists. Marx is a determinist economically. You're determined by your class membership and so on. That's what's important about you. That's where your identity comes from. Not from your own choices, not from your own thinking, from your group membership. Your membership in an economic class, your membership in a race, ethnicity, I mean taking more contemporary, ethnicity, gender, this is what's significant about you. This is what determines you. <clears throat> so, and, that, and, the, and the attitude then is the group is in control, in control in a really fundamental sense. You don't have control over your life. <clears throat> and so if you want to live, you need to turn to the group and give control to what really has control. So the various forms of collectivism all are deterministic. <clears throat> uh, the, I mean, the Germans were deterministic in regard to race, and evolution, social Darwinism is a deterministic idea that led to many forms of collectivism in the 19th and 20th century. So this, she thinks, this is the battle between individualism and collectivism. And it's a much, much, much deeper battle than a political battle. And you can't understand the political battle. And you can't understand who's winning and who's losing in the political battle if you don't understand that these deeper ideas are in play and that if everyone is talking about that determinism is right, that we're unable to reason, and so some form of authoritarianism must be the solution, and that egoism is wrong and altruism is right, if that's what people think, if that's what they accept, if that's what they're advocating, then it doesn't make much difference 
if some of them advocate for liberty. <clears throat> and let me give some flavor to this. So Ayn Rand's view of the classical liberals uh, and of the Enlightenment thinkers is they're on the side of individualism. If you take, say, Locke and the Founding Fathers, they're, both of the, these groups, and they're very similar, are on the side of free will. They're on the side that you're a rational being. Locke has a whole long essay about the power of the reasoning mind, and he thinks the reasoning mind is powerful. And the American Founding Fathers inherit this. This is, you could not have representative government. The people choosing their representatives, who are their servants, you couldn't have that view that that's the kind of government you ha we should have if you thought most people are idiots, incapable of reasoning, um, just follow the crowd and so on. You could not have that view. If you, if, if you really thought people are unable to think, you tend towards some form of authoritarianism. But the Enlightenment thinkers um, and the America's founding fathers and Locke behind them are squarely on the side of the individual's ability to reason they're implicitly on the side of egoism, and you get, as I said, the pursuit of happiness as an ideal, as a moral ideal, and they talk a lot about what it would, what's required to actually achieve your happiness, and they're the originator of the concept of rights. They're all on this side. <clears throat> but by the time you get into the 19th century, um, the thinkers, the intellectuals, and then all the people they influence, including the politicians and the media and the more popular thinkers, they've all turned against these ideas. <clears throat> and to, to give a little bit of flavor to this, the rights of man are individual rights. I think it's a true idea, but what was its ultimate defense in the Enlightenment period? Well, both from Locke and in the Declaration of Independence, rights come from God. They require for their grounding faith in God. Or let's put it a little differently, they require faith. The Enlightenment is on the side of science and is pushing faith aside and saying we should be scientific in every endeavor. That includes in politics. And if it seems like your base in politics is faith, like, what's the justification of rights? Well, we have faith. Faith can justify anything. I can have faith in the aristocracy. I can have faith in socialism. And, and you have no argument against me. If you don't need an argument for individual rights, why do I need an argument for socialism? So on one side, it became, well, if that's good, a good enough justification. We can justify any political system by faith. But even more importantly, the side of science turned away from individual rights because if individual rights are unscientific, if they rely on faith, not reason, <clears throat> if they don't have arguments and evidence behind them, why don't we try something that does have arguments and evidence behind it? And so you get scientific socialism in the 19th century, and Marx makes a big deal of this, or Marx and Engels make. It's important that they think of it as scientific socialism. Individual rights is on the side of non-science. We want to be on the side of science. Look at what science is able to do. Why not try scientific socialism? Or take the defenders, uh, I mean, Marx I don't think is a defender of freedom, though he thinks of himself in certain ways like that. Take John Stuart Mill, who's, who's thought of as one of the most important classical liberals. He explicitly says, I'm not going to base my political program on the idea of rights. And why is he not basing it on the ideal of rights? He talks about the abstract notion of rights. Now, we're not going to use that because that's a mystical, faith-based idea. And we're trying to be logical, reasonable, scientific. So we need something else. So rights goes out the door because it doesn't have a defense. It doesn't have a, a real, deep, logical argument behind it. <clears throat> All the thinkers turn against egoism. Take Mill again. Does he think that you should pursue your own happiness? No, he's a utilitarian. What your goal morally should be is the greatest happiness of the greatest number. That's morally what you should do, and he's very explicit. If the greatest happiness of the greatest number requires you to sort of erase yourself from existence, that's what you should do. 
That's what's required morally. How are you going to defend <clears throat> the pursuit of happiness when you're in, politically, when morally you said, no, that's exactly what you should not be doing? And again, Mill's considered uh, uh, one of the great classical liberals. And in certain ways, he is a defender of liberty. But does he have good arguments? No, he does not have good arguments for it. He has arguments on the side of collectivism. <clears throat> Let's do away with the idea of individual rights. Let's do away with the pursuit of happiness. If you've read on liberty, this is a collectivistic perspective on the world. His basic argument comes down to, in the end, yeah, the collective and the group has control over everything. But the individual sometimes helps the group. So the group should allow the individual to function more freely. It's the individual has to petition the group for permission to live. And if the group says, no, we don't think what you're doing is right, it affects us and we don't like what you're doing, the, the group, the collective has complete control. He's a deep in, in moral terms, he's a deep collectivist. In terms of reason versus authority, the Enlightenment champions reason. By the end of the Enlightenment, you have all kinds of views that say, reason doesn't work. So I, who I think of as the last figure of the, like last major figure of the Enlightenment is David Hume. And his whole argument is, reason doesn't re lead to knowledge, it doesn't put us in control. <clears throat> It's not a path to understanding the world or understanding values. And then you have a deep cashing in in this in the whole 19th century. Um, the, the whole line of thinkers that come after that are responding to Hume, Kant, Immanuel Kant being the most important of them, saying, yeah, Hume's right in a, in a basic sense. The mind is incapable of knowing reality. Hegel says the same, Marx says the same, Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, they're all not on the side of reason in the sense, is reason able to understand the world? They all say no. And so what you need is authoritarianism. And all these thinkers, Hegel and Marx in particular, are real authoritarians. <clears throat> so reason was seen as, no, this is not what we can use. So we need some, politically we will need some form of authoritarianism. <clears throat> And determinism is on the rise in the 19th and 20th centuries. It's, again, the, it's, the, it's a view that says the Enlightenment is wrong. <clears throat> As individual human beings, we're determined by antecedent forces. That's what science teaches us. <clears throat> again, Kant on this view is in this world, everybody's determined. <clears throat> and you get, in the 19th century, the thinkers, Hegel is a determinist in a kind of religious sense, Marx is a determinist in an economic sense, the social Darwinists are in, in determinist in a genetic kind of sense. <clears throat> Everybody turns towards determinism. And if you really don't think people have the power to choose, why would you want a system, to use Milton Friedman's term, free to choose? People don't have choice. Why, why do you want a system in which they're free to choose? That doesn't make any sense. And the, the, the people on the side of individualism, like John Stuart Mill in the 19th century, have no answer to any of these issues. No answer to the issue of free will determinism. No answer to the issue of how does reason work? What is its power? No answer to the issue of is it right to pursue your happiness? Indeed, their answer is no, it's wrong to pursue your happiness. And when you turn into the 20th century and people like Friedman, Hayek, Mises, they have no answer to these issues at all. And to the extent that they talk about these issues, they're all on the side of collectivism. So Hazlitt, for instance, is a utilitarian in regard when you read his moral work. That's what he accepts. So he accepts collectivism in a moral sense, and somehow you want to get individualism politically from that base. And you can't do it, <clears throat> or at least the, the different way to put it is, this is not a secure foundation. And what happened in the Enlightenment is they're on the side of all these ideas, but the Enlightenment thinkers, when you really read their work, don't have a good account of free will. They don't have a good account of reason. So Hume, in attacking reason and saying we're unable to know, we should be skeptics, science and induction doesn't work and so on, he's just making use of Locke's premises and saying, look, Locke has not shown the power of reason. <clears throat> he's wrong about what he thinks, he's wrong about the conclusion that his very ideas lead to. And Hume is actually right about that. 
that Locke doesn't have any kind of real explanation of why is reason powerful, what does it mean for an individual to be guided by reason. And the Enlightenment promised a defense of the pursuit of happiness. And they have a lot of interesting things to say about what it means to pursue your happiness. But to the basic issue of why is it right, why is it moral, why is it good to pursue your own happiness, the Enlightenment doesn't really have any answer to that. Locke, for instance, promises that we're going to get a mathematical demonstration of ethics and of the pursuit of happiness. But you get no such thing in Locke. It's just a promise that is never fulfilled. <clears throat> and so one way to think about Ayn Rand is she's squarely on the side of individualism. She's squarely on the side of the Enlightenment. And she's interested in understanding what free will is, what reason is, what egoism is, why all these ideas are right, what, are proper, what the proper arguments and case for these ideas are, and therefore how you put a system of individual rights on a proper and secure foundation. And so all her work philosophically is on these ideas. And, and, and in the rest of the, these two days, we're going to be talking now more about these ideas and about this conflict. So uh, Ben and Keith are going to be talking about egoism and altruism um, and, and going into some of the more details of how Rand thinks about this issue and this conflict. Uh, Yaron Brook is going to be talking more about capitalism, statism, and what it really means to say capitalism is a system of individual rights. And then tomorrow, uh, I'll be talking about free will determinism a little bit, and Ben will be talking about the issue of reason and authority. And what, so, but I, what I wanted to do is give you an overview of why we're talking about these things. This is how Ayn Rand looks at the world. This is how she looks at the battle for individualism and against collectivism, or putting it differently, the battle for the, why collectivism rose. If all the basic ideas that lead to collectivism were on the ascendancy in the 19th and 20th century, and they're all around us today, for instance, you basically can't find a thinker who's not a determinist today. <clears throat> um, and even the good thinkers, people I respect, like a Sam Harris, a Steven Pinker, they're determinists. And if this is what you're pushing, pushing, if this is what you think is right, even if you don't want to be a collectivist and you don't want to push the world towards collectivism, you are by advocating determinism. And in logic, there's no getting around that, I think. Um, so these are the ideas, the collectivist deeper ideas are on the ascendancy. And if they are, then that you get um, real movement towards various forms of statism. Even when people from some perspective understand that Look, statism doesn't work, and it's the more capitalist systems that seem to be more prosperous and so on. But if all these ideas are right, why wouldn't we try to implement these right ideas? Determinism, authoritarianism, altruism. Live for others, obey others, you don't have control. If that is all right, then what you get is collectivism. <clears throat> and there's no escaping that in the end, I think, is Rand's position, and certainly my position. Okay, let me stop here and open it up for questions. Thank you. Hello. I don't know. It's working. Uh, vocês podem fazer perguntas se direcionando a esse microfone aqui, ou então se vocês acharem que a voz de vocês é alta o suficiente, vocês podem se levantar e também fazer pergunta diretamente do local de vocês, que se sentirem mais confortáveis. Who's going to be the brave first person? É melhor que seja do microfone em função da tradução para chegar na nossa cabine, por favor. Bom dia. Uh, minha primeira pergunta é bem prática. Né? Esses, esses valores é, coletivistas estão bem fortes no, no Brasil. Como é que se defende uma ideia individualista, em poucas palavras, amigavelmente, qual é a recomendação que se faz 
para se defender uma ideia individualista, amigavelmente, é, dentro da nossa sociedade, é, vender essa ideia é, para que a gente possa um pouco ajudar a mudar essa, essa consciência. Que, que argumento rápido, em uma, poucas frases podemos usar? Um, how can you do this quickly and in a few words? I don't think it can be done. But there is things to say about the question. And the, the primary thing I would say is you have to paint a positive vision. So it's, it's not that, um, it, it's not sufficient and it's not anywhere close to sufficient to attack collectivism, to say that there's something wrong with it politically, morally, and in deeper um, roots, philosophical roots. It's important to do that, but it's nowhere close to sufficient. And until and unless people have a positive vision that they think that they're striving for, um, they're going to be on the side of collectivism. So collectivism is associated with idealism, and particularly moral idealism, that if you take morality seriously, if you take justice seriously, you should be on the side of the collective and collectivism. And to win, I think what has to happen is it has to be, no, if you're a moral person, you should be on the side of individualism. And so if, if I were trying to do it in the briefest form possible, again, it's, you can't do it in a few sentences, but the briefest form possible, I would emphasize the moral issue. That don't you think a person should be pursuing their own happiness? Don't you think their life counts and it counts for them? And that we'll have a civilized and peaceful society if everyone had this view that my life is important and your life, my life is important to me, your life is important to you. You have the right to yours, I have the right to mine. If we're going to deal with each other, we need to deal with each other as equals, not master and servant. <clears throat> and e dealing with each other as equals means we view each other as traders and the respect that trade entails. That it's your life, you're trading, you're pursuing your self-interest, and that's what you should be doing. And I'm doing exactly the same thing, and we trade and we deal with each other when we're both benefiting. You need to paint that this is a positive thing, and what it achieves then is prosperity for every individual. It enables every individual to pursue their happiness, and the system that organizes and systematizes this is a system of individual rights, which leads to capitalism. But it's, it's the positive that you have to paint for the person, not just knocking down the negative. That's what I would say. Bom dia. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> no edifício é, tão bem é, organizado no slide do individualismo está baseado em livre arbítrio, razão e egoísmo. Onde entra solidariedade nesse edifício? Porque existe. Solidariedade no individualismo. Onde ele entra nessa construção? Where does solidarity fit um, in the conception of individualism that I sketched? I think a proper conception of solidarity, so that the idea that human beings as individuals and as moral individuals have the interests that coincide, that they are compatible one with the other, so that human life is not a dog-eat-dog -dog world and not anywhere close to it, so that you have something deep in common with other people. It's, it's throughout. <clears throat> so to view yourself as capable of choice is to view other people as well. If you accept it as a principle, it's that human beings have the power of choice. Human beings as individuals have the power to reason. That means everyone has this power, leaving aside certain people who have brain damage or something like that. Every normal functioning individual has the power to think for themselves. They might not exercise that power, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that tomorrow, but they have that power. 
<clears throat> and they should be pursuing their own happiness. And if you understand what these ideas mean, that it leads to a system of individual rights, a system of individual rights. Individual rights are moral principles. They're not coming from heaven or God. They're moral principles that human beings discover and form in order to properly organize society. But it, what we're doing is organizing society, and we're organizing a society in which everyone, if they put in the thought and effort, can prosper. And from that perspective, it's a view of we're forming, to, to use the American language, we're forming a union and we're putting our interests together in order to be able to pursue each of us as individuals our own happiness. But we need to do that. We're living on a deserted island or some scattered farms where you don't interact very much with people versus living in a nation in cities like Porto Alegre where there's division of labor and trade and so on. That is all, that's the human method of survival and the human mode of survival. It comes from individuals functioning as individuals and trading with each other. So there's a deep view for the whole principle of rights, if you think of where they come from. They're about organizing into a proper society. And in that sense, it's about what the interests, the rational people have in common with one another. So the, the idea that individualism, as it will sometimes be caricatured, the, the, the individualism of the Enlightenment, that it's atomistic individualism, that it's, you view each person as isolated from the other, you don't benefit from interchange and interactions with other people, your ideal would be living on an island by yourself and so on. That's a caricature of a proper view of individualism, I think. Temos espaço para algumas perguntas ainda? Other questions? And how much time do we have left? Um, eu entendo bastante que nós, como seres humanos, nós uh, somos bastante emocionais e também agimos pela razão. E um, entendo que é, a gente uh, encontra na religião é, algum conforto na fé, etc. E muitas vezes isso talvez impede as pessoas de buscarem razões para explicar coisas que a gente sente. E, e razões para entender um pouco mais quem nós somos, por que nós agimos de determinada maneira, de determinada maneira uh, o que faz com que talvez essa é, ideia do, do egoísmo né, de, de usar a razão em primeiro lugar é, seja um pouco mais difícil de se propagar. Então, a minha pergunta seria... Por que, na verdade, é tão difícil de irradiar essa filosofia de uma maneira mais massiva uh, e de uma maneira que seja possível quebrar um pouco essa ideia coletivista que a gente vê, por exemplo, hoje em dia na Venezuela, o que está acontecendo lá até hoje, tem gente que apoia o governo, sabe, mesmo sabendo de tudo que, de todos os, os malefícios que, que eles representam, que o governo representa. Obrigada. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, let me say something about the issue of reason and emotion. This is, this is a deep philosophical issue. It's an important philosophical issue. And it's an example, I think, of the Enlightenment not getting the issue fully correct. So if you present to people that you have a choice between your reason, logic, arguments, evidence, and your emotions, and it's one or the other. If you're going to be rational and logical, it's you have to toss your emotions aside or try to suppress them down. You don't want to hear from them. <clears throat> or be emotional. Take your emotions seriously. So don't be rational. Logic is the enemy of emotions. So if you present that that's your choice in life, it's an inhuman choice. And it's hard to figure out which side you should choose of those. <clears throat> A life without emotions of never experiencing happiness, joy, pleasure. So what kind of life is that? Who wants to live that kind of life? And if that's the price of logic, 
Maybe logic's not that good, or maybe we shouldn't be logical all the time and in every area in life and so on. <clears throat> Ayn Rand's adamant that that is a false choice between reason and emotion in the sense that you, uh, ha you should only take one seriously, not the other. Emotions are really important, and if you take seriously the pursuit of happiness, happiness is an overall emotional state that you're trying to achieve, and it's an indication of that your life is going well and that you're functioning well. So she thinks the goal should be to have a harmony of reason and emotion. And this is an older Greek idea that you can bring harmony to your emotional life and your rational life. You don't choose between them. And she thinks you can bring harmony to them because your emotions in the end come from your thinking, from your past thinking. <clears throat> I mean, and, and to take a kind of simple examples to show that it, it, your emotions depend on your thinking, your cognition, your knowledge, and your values. If, God forbid, someone burst into this room with a machine gun and says, you're all going to die, I mean, what would, people's, what would your reaction be to that? It would be panic, fear, you would run or duck for cover and so on. What explains that emotion of fear? Well, you know this is bad news. You, the guy has a gun, he seems like he's um, up to no good, and that you, you recognize it, you see it, you understand it, and you feel an emotion. Your emotions come from your past thinking, your ideas, your values that you're now living and stored in your mind. <clears throat> and you can learn to change your emotions. Um, so they're, they're a product of your ideas, is Rand's view, and as your ideas change, your values change. Um, you can ask Yaron, who's going to be one of the later speakers. He used to be a socialist and would have, when, he, when, when socialist politicians and so on, causes would win, he would have, you would have a certain kind of emotion if you were a socialist. If you come to think, well, no, socialism is wrong and, so, and capitalism is right, your emotions about the, the whole political environment change dramatically. Your emotions come from your ideas. It's not always easy to figure out what are the ideas generating the emotions, particularly in personal relationships, and you can simultaneously like a person and not like the person, and you're wondering, why is it that I feel conflicted about this person? But what you need to do is think, and you need to think and introspect, like what are the reasons, what am I responding to that I think is positive about this person? What, what are kind of warning signs that I'm picking up on the periphery of my thought about I should be a little suspicious of this person or a little cautious in regard to this person. Your emotions come from your ideas or come from your reasoning. Good reasoning, bad reasoning, true ideas, false ideas, good values, bad values. <clears throat> to bring harmony between your reason and your emotions is to th really think through the ideas that I accept. And not just the ideas that I voice and tell other people that I think are true. So the ideas that I've really accepted and am practicing in my life. And if you do that, and if you do this as a way of life, you can bring a real harmony to your reason and emotions. And you should take your emotions really seriously. They're not a path to knowledge. They don't tell you what's true or false. They only tell you what you think is true or false, good or bad. And you have to really then think about that. If you're a socialist, what your ideas are telling you is that I think socialism is true and that it's good. Is that correct? Is that the right view? And if you come to think, no, it's not the right view, you can change your ideas and your emotions change. So there's not a choice in life between should I go by my reason or should I go by my emotions. It is you should think. And you should also think about your emotions and why you're experiencing them. And you can change them. <clears throat> and so the, the, the second part of the question was about people in collectivistic countries supporting, like Venezuela, supporting the government. <clears throat> I think there's a lot of things to say about that kind of issue. Some of the people are just, they're not really thinking, and I think they're not good people. Many of the supporters of bad regimes are bad people. But what also happens, and this is one of the reasons that politics is really important, there's virtuous cycles and there's vicious cycles. So the more you preach determinism, authoritarianism, altruism, <clears throat> the more collectivism in a political, some kind of um, what the state has absolute power, that is seen as the ideal. But a person living in that kind of situation more and more comes to think of their lives as, yeah, I don't have any control. I'm determined by the group. The group is in control. I'm powerless. I don't really have a power of choice. 
<clears throat> and come to think of themselves as, I can't figure out things, and if they, you cut off information and you cut off access to knowledge and education, as they do in many of these regimes, you think, yeah, some form of authority, I'm always being told what to do and that's how I have to function. <clears throat> so you, the, the very system inculcates the ideas that support the system. And so once a country turns and has for generations some form of collectivism, it's hard for the country to get out of it because people have absorbed the ideas and they have some plausibility of, yeah, this really is how the world functions. I think they're still mistaken, but you can understand why people would be more um, susceptible to these ideas and think that they're true if they're living in the system where those ideas seem to be true. And I think that's part, you see it, I think that's part of what you saw in the whole communist bloc and people after the fall of the Berlin Wall. There were people who said, well, life was better under the communist regime because people told me what to do and I had my place and I had my station in life and so on. And the, the idea of now you have vast choices that you have to face, really? Like how, and how do I make these choices? I don't think for myself. It's uh, people tell me what to do. So how do I function in this environment? And that's a real phenomenon. It's a, it's a sad phenomenon, but I think a real phenomenon. <clears throat> Other questions? Yeah, we have a question. Do we have? Um, I'm gonna make my question in Portuguese so everybody can get a better sense of it. Um, I'm trusting the <laughs> yeah, okay. that you have the right idea. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, os seres humanos eles têm diferentes níveis de intelectualidade, cultura background, criação. Não é utópico pensar que todo ser humano vai ter a vontade e a capacidade intelectual ou, enfim, filosófica de querer se libertar de dogmas religiosos que, por vezes, são coletivistas, mas que, em muitas vezes, são os únicos pilares que salvam pessoas que não têm outros tipos de pilares morais como ex-drogados, ex-traficantes, ex-homicidas, no saldo geral da sociedade, num balanço, não seria mais positivo uh, nós defendermos a liberdade das pessoas escolherem no que elas acreditam como pilares morais e éticos, seja advindo de um dogma religioso, seja advindo de um, uma filosofia moral mais profunda, do indivíduo, do indivíduo, do que advocar pela, uh, pela, por acabar, digamos assim, com a fé, moralidade ou dogmas. Eu acredito que as pessoas muitas vezes acabam se beneficiando disso para fazer o bem para ela, para sua família, enfim, a nível né, geral. Tu não acha que o balanço disso seria positivo? Um, so the so the question is or at least my translation or paraphrase of the question, uh, for the average person, since there's a lot of variation in people's uh, intellect, their education, their family circumstances, can the average person understand the ideas of individualism? Or do, is it better that for some of these it will be more an issue of faith than that they really understand the arguments for these ideas. I think, but this again, this, this goes to the issue of do you think of individual human beings as rational, as capable of thinking? I think they are, that they have this power. Now it's true that some people have a great, greater intellectual abilities than others. It's true, for sure true, that some people have better education than others. But if they're capable of reasoning, you can make arguments in terms that they can understand. <clears throat> um, and that's what you should be doing when you're dealing with other people. Give them reasons and arguments and evidence and facts that support your view. <clears throat> yes, I do not think every person will become a philosopher or will understand the ideas of individualism in a deep philosophical sense. But you can explain to people that you've got one life, it's your life, 
uh, you can pr explain to them the importance of happiness, the pursuit of your own happiness, and that you have control over your life and you have to take charge of it. And you can also explain to them, uh, uh, and we'll talk about this a little more as the day goes through, have you ever heard an argument for altruism? So people tell you you have to live for the needy, you have to live for the poor, you have to live for the proletariat, the nation counts, the German people count. What's the argument for that position? Ayn Rand said there's one word that can blast altruism, and it's why. Why is that the good? And there's been no, there's no um, <clears throat> logical secular argument for that position. So you can both give people <clears throat> evidence for why, look, you've got one life to live, it can go well or it can go badly. Values come from the fact that you're a living thing pursuing goals in the world, <clears throat> the things that advance your life are good, the things that uh, harm it are bad. This is how you should look at the world. Take your happiness seriously. And when people tell you you should live for others, you can ask the question, why? And you'll be surprised how often you don't get any answer. It will be, why are you asking that question? Everybody knows it's moral to pursue the, the good of others, to pursue the needy, the greatest happiness of the greatest number. Well, you ask why. Well, everybody knows it. Yeah, but let's say I don't know it. What argument will you give me? And you don't get arguments for it. So I, have, I think, and when you look in, in the Enlightenment period and when you look in 19th century America, they had a common sense understanding of many of these ideas, not a deep philosophical perspective on them, but common sense. And I think an average person can grasp these ideas. But it's, again, presenting them with a positive vision not just what's wrong with the collectivist side. It's important to do that, but as a secondary issue. It's to paint a positive. Look, you could take charge of your life. You can live in a country where you can pursue your own happiness. And let me say one last thing on this. One major piece of evidence that the average person, if he's thinking, if he chooses to think, and we're going to talk a little bit about that tomorrow, can grasp that the pursuit of happiness is good, the idea of individual rights is good. So the reason people wanted to come to America in the 19th century was not because there's social security and Medicare and a bunch of handouts. They wanted to come because they thought, in this place, I can pursue my own happiness. My life is mine, it counts. I can make of it what I want. And all I want is freedom. <clears throat> and the average person could understand that. So I have much more confidence in their ability to think if they're presented with a positive vision, as they were. They can't all be Thomas Jefferson, but they can read the Declaration and say, yeah, this is a place that I would want to live. Vamos agora a última pergunta, Onkar. Hello? Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to maybe compliment to, to say that <clears throat> Um, you don't need to be very intelligent. You don't need to be extremely educated to pursue your happiness. Uh, so any, any person can see reality or have, has the capability to see the reality. Yeah, I definitely agree. And I think if you, if you read Ayn Rand's novels, you get this perspective on the world as well. So she did not think only the elites or the super educators can grasp um, the importance of freedom and some of the ideas that ground um, freedom. And her, in her novels, there's characters on the, on the good side of average intelligence, average ability and so on, but they're choosing to think. And there's characters of tremendous ability, tremendous intelligence, so who turn away from the facts and who turn away from reality. And we'll be talking about this a little bit tomorrow, that she thinks everyone has basic choice to orient themselves towards the world and towards the facts or not. And that is irrespective of a person's intelligence, ability, education. Um, so yeah, I definitely agree. <clears throat>